Thank you very much for coming. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Jack Spraga, and uh, uh, it's my honor and privilege to serve as president of uh, this great institution, Bristol Community College. If some of you haven't been here before, I hope you enjoy the uh, beautiful campus that we have. We arranged a great day for you and uh, uh, wonderful scenery. Uh, so please, uh, please take adva advantage of uh, all that we offer here at Bristol. For those of you who don't know a little bit about Bristol, uh, we're up at uh, 12,000 students uh, in a year. We're the third of 15 community colleges. We're the third largest of the, all the 15, the other two up in, Mass up in Boston. Uh, so uh, we're very excited. Every, uh, the community colleges in Connect, uh, uh, Massasoit Community College, Cape Cod Community College, as well as Bristol Community College. Uh, and we service uh, uh, the region at the community college associate's degree level. And we also have in Connect uh, five institutions. So the other two are uh, Bridgewater State University and the University of Massachusetts Dharma. So it's a really uh, a wonderful situation in our region uh, to have the three segments, the community colleges, the state universities, and, uh, and the University of Massachusetts uh, all represented in our region. And I know you know as well as the rest of us that we have quite a challenge with uh, two, I call them evil plagues of our region, uh, the uh, uh, levels of literacy and levels of educational attainment in our region. And uh, uh, the five presidents and CEOs and chancellors uh, take very seriously our, uh, our obligation to correct those two, uh, those two terrible uh, statistics about our region. Um, you're going to hear more uh, from uh, about Connect, uh, but I did want to uh, also recognize uh, Representative Sean O'Connell is here uh, from uh, the Taunton area generally and other areas as well. But thank you very much for coming coming down. <laughs> and uh, I hope you survived the traffic all right. This street coming to the college uh, has also two, not one, but two high schools. Uh, so you can imagine at quarter of eight, uh, it gets to be very congested and uh, uh, lots, of, uh, uh, lots of horn blowing and uh, finger pointing and uh, uh, yelling. And uh, <laughs> I was in Southeast Asia, I never heard words that I've heard on uh, Ellsbury Street <laughs> at the rush hour. <laughs> well, uh, let's get going uh, quickly. I want to get out of here. I gave you a little commercial about Bristol. Uh, but uh, we'd like you to know more about the, the larger group, Connect. We really stand out, as uh, Davina, I'm sure, will tell you. We really stand out in the state uh, in terms of uh, regional, regional collaborations. And I'd like to uh, recognize Kathleen Kirby as our director of uh, Connect, executive director. <clears throat> and Kim Williams, also in Connect, uh, helping us out. The, these things wouldn't happen without, uh, without their expert uh, leadership. So now it's my honor to introduce a great uh, pal of mine. Uh, in just a short time, we became uh, very close friends, and uh, uh, it's an honor to work with her and connect. She is the uh, chair this year, uh, or maybe the next year too, but she's the chair of, uh, of the Connect uh, Consortium, and it's my honor to introduce to you the chancellor of UMass Dartmouth, Davina Grossman. Davina? Good morning, everyone. You know, we have to thank uh, President Brega because you cannot get food as good as you get at Bristol Community College. So thank you for hosting us. And I, too, would like to welcome all of our speakers this morning and Representative Sean O'Connell uh, and all of you. Um, so I spent the last few days in Washington, D.C. for the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities uh, Conference and also had meetings at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the U.S. Department of Agriculture and other federal agencies that support our faculty and our students and that support our region. So um, they are having the same kinds of discussions as we're going to have uh, this morning. Uh, so I'm sure that all of you are looking forward to the panel. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge the other uh, presidents of CONNECT. Uh, I don't see them here, but uh, they are, uh, in addition to President Jacques Brega, President Dana Muller Faria from Bridgewater State University, President Charlie Wall from Massasoit Community College, and also President John Cox 
from Cape Cod Community College. I'm sure they will be coming after this because we're launching our strategic planning process for Connect at a meeting after this meeting. Um, and I have given the honor of chairing Connect, as uh, Jack said. Um, this is a, a partnership that has been in place for the last 10 years. So we have to honor the vision of those who established Connect because it is a model for other regions of the Commonwealth and also for other regions of the country. One of the things we'll be doing today is to recognize the achievements of Connect for the last 10 years at the meeting after this before we mount the strategic planning for the initiative. So let me just tell you about the goals of Connect. So the two major goals are to improve the quality, the accessibility, and the affordability of public higher education in our region. So that's a very important goal that we take seriously. And the second is to advance the economic, educational, and cultural life of southeastern Massachusetts. So those are our two important goals. And that is carried out in various ways through the initiatives and partnerships uh, such as the shared internship portal, the STEM network, and other activities of Connect. The theory of Connect is that you cannot have one without the other. That is, what brings us today is not only that shared vision, but also that perspective that what we do among the educational institutions has a consequential impact on our region in the South Coast. So I look forward to the um, remarks of our distinguished panel. We have, beginning from here, on my side, going that way, we have Rebecca Lashman, Senior Vice President of the Commonwealth Corporation. We have Peter Georgiopoulos, uh, CEO of the Greater New Bedford Community Health Center. We have Kim Holland, President and CEO of Signature Healthcare. And at the far end is, you know, all know David DeJesus, Senior Vice President of Human Resources for the South Coast Health System. Let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> so as part of the meetings that I've had in Washington, DC, um, was a conversation with um, a man named uh, Matt Hines, who's a physician, who's a special assistant to Secretary Sebelius. And I discussed with him a bit the discussion that took place on Tuesday here in the South Coast, led by uh, Representative Pat Haddad and uh, Speaker uh, DeLeo. I was not able to be here because I was in DC, but um, the purpose of the meeting with DHHS and the Division of Nursing was to understand what kind of federal support is available through grant mechanisms in order to help with the problem of uh, mental and behavioral uh, services that are lacking in our region. So we're hoping to be able to prepare and submit a grant uh, to DHHS uh, this year. Uh, hopefully will we'll be supported uh, in the year after uh, through the uh, resources of HRSA, Health Resources and Services Administration. But I can tell you that in meetings with other presidents and chancellors of universities across the country that uh, are also uh, in meetings with some of our federal agency leaders, that everyone is having a conversation about health and the health of our communities across the country. And in our region, not only is health uh, the largest industry, right? Healthcare is the largest industry and South Coast Health System is the biggest employer, but also we have profound health disparities in our region in various chronic conditions, whether it's um, diabetes, obesity, heart disease, and other conditions. Uh, but also we have a high rate of the uninsured in our region, even though it's generally low in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts compared to other states, of course, because we have had the version of the Affordable Care Act in the Commonwealth ahead of others in the country. But still, I think in our region, we still are experiencing uh, some of the uh, shortages uh, in professional services and also shortages in the availability of care uh, and some of the changes that are transpiring across the country because of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. So I know that many of you, how many of you were at that meeting on Tuesday? The Mental Health and Behavioral Summit. 
Okay, so, so there were at least uh, three of you that were there. Uh, so we're hoping to hear more about uh, that and the plan for addressing the mental health and behavioral needs of this region moving forward in the weeks and months to come. As public higher education institutions, the Connect uh, presidents and our respective institutions have an obligation to work with the healthcare industry, with community organizations, federal and state government in order to respond to the challenge. And the challenge is very clear, and that is we have to recruit, recruit more, educate more, and graduate more um, members of the healthcare workforce who would be able to deliver healthcare services in various areas that would be effective, um, efficient, and certainly that would meet uh, the criterion of affordability. Uh, and if we succeed, we know that all our businesses in the region will be more prosperous because healthcare coverage is also one of the most uh, extensive, one of the most costly, right, in terms of uh, the employers. Uh, so the more we can get that to be more affordable and more efficient and more effective, the better for all of us, and the more prosperous will be our businesses and our corporations. And certainly our school children will learn more because health is a very important prerequisite to learning, and certainly our communities will be stronger. So hopefully in this conversation, we'll be able to address some of those issues, and we will have a plan moving forward for Connect and Connect's role in building the healthcare workforce in this region. So I would now like to invite our, um, I'm looking for my cheat sheet here, our moderator, oh, she's, she's sitting there, who will be introducing the panel and who will be um, also managing the open forum at the end. Uh, Sheila, do you uh, want to come forward? If you would all give a round of applause to our moderator and also to our speakers. By the way, you all have the um, packet and the program. So um, if not, uh, they're out front there. And I would like to also, uh, just like President Sprega did, I would like to also acknowledge Dr. Kathleen Kirby and Kim sitting out there. They're the ones who put this uh, meeting together. And they do a lot of work behind the scenes. OK, so thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. We look forward to a, a very productive morning today to talk about health care in the workforce. One of the first things that we're going to take a look at is really to set the table is the data related to health care in the workforce itself. And to do that, I'm going to introduce Rebecca Lashman from the Commonwealth Corporation. Um, so I think uh, being passed out now are two documents. I'm going to uh, refer to both of them. Uh, one is, uh, looks like this. It's called the Massachusetts Healthcare Chart Book. I pulled a few pieces out of this chart book for the presentation this morning, but wanted you all to have a copy of your own. Uh, might be easier to read in this format also. Uh, and then the second is uh, just a copy of the slides that I'll be going through. Um, Kathleen has asked me to be really tight around time management. So if I pause for a second, it's because she's waving me to speed it up. So uh, I'll uh, do my best to really, as uh, Sheila said, just set the stage and um, really hear from the folks in the industry who know a lot about uh, what their needs are now and what's coming up. Um, so today, I just wanted to talk about uh, really three things. Let's see if this um, I wanted to give you just a little bit of an overview of the industry and its composition um, with some information about how, that's, how it's composed in this region. Um, and by region, I mean everything from the Cape um, up through Brockton, South Shore, Quincy, sort of the whole Southeast region, all of the geography that's covered by Connect. Um, I pulled some data that's about um, current vacancies that are posted uh, online um, by many of the healthcare employers in this region. And I thought it'd be interesting just to take a look at that. It's not, um, 
It's not research that's done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, but it's really current, and I think it's got really interesting information in there, and I'd be really interested to hear what our panelists have to say about, about that, those data. Um, and then just a few points on what we're hearing um, as we go around the state from healthcare employers about um, skill needs that are emerging um, and some occupational demand that seems to be emerging as a result of the Affordable Care Act and Chapter 224, which is the um, health care quality and cost containment legislation that was passed in, here in Massachusetts summer a year ago. Uh, so that's, that's what we'll do quickly. Um, so this next slide, maybe, Let's see how we do. There we go. So this next slide you will also, you will also see in the chart book. Um, this is for each of the regions um, um, in, the, in the southeast. This, is, this shows you two things. The, the number at the very top of each bar tells you what percent of all employment in the region is in healthcare. So, for example, Bristol County, 17%. Does that make sense? And then the little colored bars tell you how that um, workforce is broken up by subsectors of the healthcare industry. And so there are four subsectors, social assistance, nursing and residential care, hospitals, and ambulatory health care with a little co color coding. So you can see that there is some difference between the regions in the southeast around the makeup of that, of that health care sector. Does that make sense? And then I provided Massachusetts as a, as a context. So in all cases, obviously, health care is a large share of employment in, in any of these regions. Um, then the next slide shows you this one's a little hard to get your head around, um, so just take a minute and describe it. And again, it's in the chart book, so you can uh, go back and look at it at your leisure. So then the, this takes each of those four segments of the healthcare sector. So see across the bottom, it says ambulatory, hospitals, nursing, social assistance. So those are those industry segments. And then, it sh then the bars above sh take occupational groups and show you how that industry is staffed. So let's take the first one, ambulatory care, that big yellow block at the top, 40%. So 40% of all workers in ambulatory care are healthcare practitioners and technicians. Kind of makes sense, right? But let's shift over to the far, what would that be? The right over there? The far right bar, which is the social assistance bar. Healthcare practitioners and technicians are only 4%. Makes sense, right? I mean, that's mostly social services, social assistance. There are, however, healthcare practitioners working in the social service and social assistance uh, segment. So again, I won't linger on this, but I think it's interesting to get your heads around the different staffing structures associated with the different components of the industry. Um, for all of us who work in workforce development, our first challenge is to get to know the industry better and to try to understand which segments of the industry our business employer partners fall into so we can have a better handle around how they staff. Does that make sense? Okay, then the next several slides, and I'll uh, go through these fairly quickly. So this is, these are vacancy data that come out of something called Help Wanted Online. Now, I know the community colleges in Massachusetts all have started to, or some have for a few years, been working with Help Wanted Online. I'm not sure about the four-year institutions. It's a really interesting tool. Um, in part, it's used for job search and job development, but it also has interesting analytics associated with it. And so you can um, request information by geography, by industry sector, by occupation, by level of education required, a bunch of things. And so I just started to experiment with it, really, just to see what we could see in this region. The thing I like about it is it's live, current data. It comes from the mining of Help Wanted ads that are posted online um, in all kinds of online forums around the state. I'm assured that there are algorithms that control for duplication. Uh, just say that up front. Um, there's, if anybody wants to look at the user's manual, there's lots of math language that I don't understand in there that describes how they handle that. There are some caveats associated with using these data. Um, 
for positions where employers don't really hire by posting online, you'll see them much less represented uh, in these data. Um, and some employers don't use online um, uh, technology as a recruiting resource. So that, those are the big caveats. I still think there's some interesting uh, information in here, so I'll just sort of give you an overview of that. And anybody who's interested after, I can uh, talk with you a little bit more about what we can find from it. So I pulled just for these regions, and I looked for just current job openings in the healthcare and social assistance sector and found more than 1,700 that are deemed current. Um, I thought it'd be interesting to see whether um, uh, experience mattered. Uh, no surprise, it does. So when I sorted and asked w which of those openings that really only required you know, two years or less experience, it dropped by almost two thirds. That is what we're hearing from a lot of healthcare businesses around the state. It's really tough to hire people who don't have uh, some experience. This holds true across most of the educational level classifications for occupations in healthcare. And not surprising, all of us would prefer to hire somebody who has some experience rather than train them, train them up from scratch. Um, and then I just listed. Uh, the businesses that came up as having um, 50 or more postings associated with these 1,700-ish postings. So then the next slide, um, maybe. There we go. So next slide, I just I did the sort just by occupations that require high school degree or less. One more caveat I should offer. Uh, these, these educational designations are assigned by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, not by the businesses that posted the ads. We do know that in Massachusetts, we have occupations where businesses are requiring a higher level of education than is the standard across the country. I'll point out a couple of those as go along. I expect that our panel can um, uh, point out some others. So there will be some you'll see in here that are classified as potentially a, needing a lower level of education than is really the reality uh, in terms of the healthcare employment in Massachusetts. So I won't read this to you um, except to say uh, there aren't a gazillion job openings for people with high school degree or less, probably not surprising. Um, on the next slide, I pulled the ones that came up. Um, I really was just looking for ones that I knew were likely to be in there just to see what the numbers were. Um, so here's one where I would say pharmacy technician, depending on the environment that a pharmacy technician is hired in, uh, might require more than high school level of ed education. However, we do know that folks at CVS are being hired without, uh, high school uh, without more than a high school education and CVS is training them to their specifications. So it's a range and it's always important to understand the setting that folks are gonna be hired in and what the specific business needs are. I don't think the others will be surprising to anybody here in the room. Uh, I sorted by um, post-secondary non-degree, so these would be post-secondary certificates ranging from the very, very short certified nursing aid up to surgical technologist, technician positions, um, LPN would be in here. Um, again, you see that there's a pretty um, significant interest in, in hiring people who already have experience. So again, we're dropped by what, like two thirds when we get, when we sort by the, by, by the level of experience. And here's the list that uh, popped up when I uh, sorted in this category. Uh, I have to say at the bottom there, you'll see dental assistant two. I, honestly, this is a little bit of a mystery to me because we're hearing that there's need in the dental aid, dental assistant, and I looked for a dental hygienist when I got to um, associates and bachelor's degrees, and d it didn't pop up. I don't know if it's that they're not, that's, that employers don't hire using online resources for those positions, or if there really isn't you know, yet uh, a big need. I'm not sure, but I was a little surprised that I didn't see that come up a little bit higher. Here's uh, associate's degrees. Um, again, real interest in people with experience. 
here's the list that I came up with. Uh, certainly, we know if you see registered nurse there, this is where the data set's not so helpful. You'd have to actually go into the actual job postings. We know that there's an increasing emphasis on bachelor's prepared uh, registered nurses. The, the standard is um, associate's degree across the country. So this is where folks who have this resource should really actually dive in deeper and look at the actual job postings to, to see what's being required. Um, and then just a couple more. Here's the bachelor's, master's, and higher. Pulled these out um, just to take a look. Even more emphasis on experience. Um, and here's what popped up when I, when I did some sorts. So we have been hearing about pharmacists. You'll see that toward the bottom there. Um, certainly family practice physicians, you know, internists we're hearing, nurse practitioner, physician's assistant. So that, nothing in here that really jumped out as me, at me as occupations we hadn't been hearing about. And I'll say one more thing and then just wrap it up. Um, I didn't pull the social service professions when I was doing this. I, was, I understood that that was less of an interest um, in terms of this discussion. So you would absolutely see social workers, case managers, counselors, behavioral health workers, substance abuse counselors. They would absolutely pop up if I pulled for those. Um, and we're seeing lots and lots of postings. And those, obviously, the, that, those titles range everything from somebody who's a residential overnight counselor um, in, a, in a facility to masters prepared and doctoral prepared clinicians who were supervising teams of case managers and caseworkers. So big range in those occupational titles. Okay, two more uh, points to make. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning, we've been hearing a lot about emerging needs that are related to the Affordable Care Act and to the passage of Chapter 224. Um, Commonwealth Corporation is currently administering uh, a fund called the Healthcare Workforce Transformation Trust Fund. It's a mouthful that I try not to say fast. Um, this trust fund was established in um, the passage of Chapter 224 specifically for the purpose of providing resources to healthcare employers and their partner educational institutions as they try to incorporate um, new practices and new um, services related to Chapter 224, to cost containment, quality improvement, and all of the other missions associated with Chapter 224. So we're currently accepting planning grant proposals, and so some of this information comes from the requests that we're seeing in the planning grant proposals, and some of it comes from conversations I and some of my colleagues and a bunch of you have been having around the state. I won't read these to you, I'll just point out a couple of them and then uh, wrap it up. But I'll tell you what, we hear, everywhere I go, we hear that the role of medical assistant um, is changing. We certainly hear that in the context of community health centers and physicians' practices. Um, so that's a really interesting one to look out for and to ask our employer partners a little bit more about. Um, increasingly, we're hearing about physical therapy and occupational therapy and the need for it to be delivered in home settings, not just in outpatient and institutional settings, and some interest in thinking about the way that physical therapists and occupational therapists are prepared to work in those different settings and with an increasingly older population. Um, this, uh, the role of community health workers, which I think is tied to the medical assisting discussion, at least in some places. Those folks who have expertise around health education, but may not have the clinical expertise and being asked to sometimes play a dual role there. Um, supportive home care aides. So these are the home care aides who would be working with um, individuals who have behavioral health um, uh, needs and so this, we're hearing an increasing need for home care aides who know how to work with people who have uh, mental health and behavioral health uh, needs. Um, I think call center and claim center processing is probably self-evident except to say that what we're hearing increasingly is that uh, the, the organizations that do that work need staff who have really good patient engagement, communication, and some patient education uh, skill set. They're becoming coaches instead of just order takers. Uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. 
the integration of primary care and behavioral health, as um, the chancellor said, the chancellor said earlier, that lots of discussion about what's the workforce needs associated with that. Um, and then, oops, only if I go the right direction. Uh, these last come up over and over and over again, really more about skill sets that everybody needs or that are sort of increasingly needed, associated with using electronic medical records, mining for information about how to get at patients who aren't using the services in a way that would be best useful to them, um, teamwork and communication as we have teams of clinicians across all levels who are working on care coordination and care transition, patient engagement and health education I talked, out before, talked about before, and process improvement. Everybody, everybody, everybody is looking for ways to do the work well, but do it more efficiently and more cost effectively. Um, the manufacturing sector has a little bit of a leg up on broadly speaking the healthcare sector, but there are definitely healthcare businesses around the state that are well into this um, looking at building skill sets around lean and process improvement in their, in their workforce. So I'll stop there. Um, Kathleen, I'm not sure, just, do we just do questions later? Okay, all right, so thanks very much. Thank you, Rebecca. That's um, some of the really great information that we can use in a variety of different manners. Um, the data that we're looking at really can help us form and develop programs to meet and respond to some of the needs. What we're gonna look at now really is the down and dirty, the direct needs. Um, we've got three great individuals with us today that are gonna talk a little bit about their experiences in healthcare and how um, the system is being driven in the next couple of years. So Rebecca spent some time talking about occupations and um, the demand. And towards the end, really, we've started to refer to a little bit about skills. So I guess I'd like to start there. And if you could maybe address what you think or what you feel are the most important skills that are needed in your industry, and then follow that up with maybe the occupations that you see are in the most demand. David, I'm going to have you start. Your territory. Is it possible to share the microphone? I'm sorry for the video. Is there a way to share it? Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Um, let, let me first say I, I feel it's a bit of a challenge to uh, say something new today that a lot of folks have not heard. I, I look around the room and there's so many folks who have been involved with workforce investment uh, from BCC to UMass to uh, the Healthcare Collaborative, Mike Metzler and other folks, the WIBs, et cetera. So uh, a bit of a challenge. I hope I, hope I can bring something new to the discussion. Uh, it's interesting to see the summary of, of the report uh, and the emerging skill needs, because each of us are in our own worlds and uh, uh, addressing things. And then you look up and see that these are statewide issues. So it's, it's a bit uh, reassuring to see that people are challenged with some of the same issues. I, I would say in terms of skills, uh, I, I would break it down in terms of what I would call the hard skills or business skills and then some of the soft skills. So uh, on the business skills side of things, certainly uh, the area of uh, more quantitative analysis is something that is becoming uh, part of more professions uh, during, the, during the course of healthcare reform as we are seeing it. Uh, more work with healthcare informatics is happening uh, on the clinical side. So we are looking for clinicians, RNs, pharmacists, et cetera, who have the skill base in terms of healthcare informa informatics, working with data sets, big data, as, as the common press has it, uh, taking information uh, in population health management that spans across the region and distilling that into usable information as we set our programs and our services throughout, uh, throughout the area. Technology continues to be uh, a primary source from the medical assistance, as, as mentioned here. Uh, the use of technology, uh, the uh, facility with technology continues to be a growing need. So with medical assistance, the ability to interact with technology through every profession within the organization uh, as, as part of their, their daily work. 
The area of project management, which probably ties to process improvement, is another key business skill. The pace of work continues to move very quickly, and the need to have very tight project management of work start process and then ending of that project management is, is also a key. And, th and then on the soft skills side, uh, it's been mentioned about the customer service end. And for those who don't work in healthcare, you might think that that should have been there all along. Uh, and, and customer service has been there, uh, but it's been there in a different way. You know, in the hospital setting, for example, employees are in their own natural place and patients come to them. And more and more we are, as we expand, and again, through healthcare reform, it's more about outreach to patients and connecting to patients and transferring patients through the healthcare continuum rather than a simple discharge, for example, or a simple admission. It's providing services through a continuum in a place where the patient is comfortable versus perhaps where the employee is comfortable. So I think that also speaks to communication and, and team orientation. And, and then lastly, I, I would say a transition from task orientation into more broader uh, problem solving, holistic view of issues rather than simply doing a task as, as it is laid out. Uh, RNs, for example, have always had the assessment skills necessary, et cetera, but more and more it's about all employees being able to look at a situation, determining what's needed in that situation, then applying a resolution to it rather than simply following orders or expectations as, as they may have been laid out in advance. So those are the skills that, that we see in place. Uh, I'll hold and we can talk about professions a little bit later on. I was impressed, Rebecca, with your ability to what I think is nail the issues uh, from an external point of view uh, relative to your positions. And it's hard to add to uh, what, you, what you've laid out, which is great. So let me start somewhere else. I'll start real high just for a second and then drill down. But I think there's a sea change going on in healthcare delivery, which we speak about through 224, and I don't know if you have the same perspective of that I do uh, from my chair, but Massachusetts is ahead of the other parts of the country moving from fee-for-service medicine, where we're paid to take care of people as they come to us, to medicine where we're given a global budget of some sort, either it's episode of care, for 90 days or it's a flat budget like an insurance company, but we're really being incentivized to keep people out of the system rather than in the system. And that's the fundamental change that's going on that I think is driving the skill need and driving the job differential. And that's going to play out in a number of ways. One, one thing I guess that wasn't mentioned is I think we're going to continue to see a drop in volume of the inpatient sector, which will drop jobs. Our volumes at Signature Brockton were down by 7% last year over the year before. Massachusetts, uh, people would say, have an admission rate that's 35% higher than the national average. So as we drop and manage care, we should see a decline in the number of filled inpatient beds. That will drop jobs in sort of the big box part of health care. So I think that is a trend that will continue to mature over the next few years. I heard a statistic earlier this week that I thought was fascinating at, that as the state is beginning through 224 to grab data and look at trends and compare Massachusetts to other parts of the country, not only is the admission rate high for inpatient institutions, but the admission rate for post-acute care, rehabilitation, long-term acute care, skilled nursing is 77% higher than it is in the nation. So we have high number of beds in rehab, long-term acute care, skilled nursing. So those jobs are going to fall over the next 10 years. That, that is going to change. We have found in our own institution we can do a better job using home health uh, people and not, and not employing ourselves. We work with VNA and partners, home health, to move care out of the hospital into the home rather than long-term acute care, rehab, and skilled nursing. So I think that will be a shift in where people are employed, and that will be important to acknowledge over the next few years. And then as, as we have been challenged to say, okay, how do you keep people well and keep people out of the system? What's that practically look like on the ground? So that's where data mining comes from because we're now getting all the claims data that the insurance used to keep and never give providers. They're giving to us now if we'll take risk. 
which means we now have a data warehouse and that creates a number of IT needs. And we're now asking our providers to put things in a record in a way that we can get it out of the record to determine what healthcare needs are. That's driving coding, it's driving physicians into different uses of IT, and it's, and it's increasing internally the number of IT staff we need and the staff who are competent of using the computer, really because we want to know how we make a diabetic take their medications and stay out of the system, and that's part of data mining. I think the other thing I think worth going back to touch on is lean process improvement, which you covered, but I want to cover from a different fundamental level just to push an issue because I think you can help us as a partner. Healthcare is not as safe as the nuclear power industry. It is not as safe as the airline industry. If you go back to 1999, there was a seminal report in healthcare that said 99,000 people die unnecessarily in healthcare. There was a report this past year that says it's as high as 400,000. As, as we in our industry really are behind plant management, we are 10 to 15 to 20 years probably behind what I think has gone on in manufacturing. And as we begin to stretch and move in the direction of a safer system and a system that has higher quality, we're being held more accountable. We're being asked to prevent da present data. But fundamentally, in inside our institutions, I think you're seeing a revolution going on in healthcare, moving from transactional medicine, where people come in and do their jobs as defined by management, to asking every employee to begin helping us improve their job as part of their job. And that is a significant shift. So if you go to what happened in the, in the car industry in Kentucky when Toyota put their first plant in Kentucky, they quickly found that they couldn't hire anybody that could work in the automobile plant under a lean understanding. So they went, reached into the high schools to teach their own people and they were willing to hire people who may have run a toy store to work on the plant floor because they needed people who are problem solvers who could really understand process, process flow, error proofing, and problem solving to a root cause no matter what the job was. So if you think that's where plants were 20 years ago as cars became higher quality and we began to have to um, deal with quality issues and cost issues in that industry. That's where healthcare is going. It will take us 15 years to get there. But I think a fundamental difference for us, for an employee coming in the door, not only is it a few years of experience, but I think a difference maker for us, whether they're coming out of high school or coming out of any clinical program, is somebody who fundamentally understands what safety looks like, how to error proof a process, how to, how to critically think about what they're doing so that their job is as much improving their job as it is their job. Working in a team to do that will make a difference for those employees. And that is a fundamental change that has to happen in our industry where education, I think, needs to add it to a core competency. We're working with a university in Pennsylvania to, um, to bring lean into our organization. And they took an approach in their business school that you couldn't get out of the business school without an undergraduate degree in organizational effectiveness as a part of having an undergraduate degree in business because they, they are working in an, in, in an area of the country where there's heavy manufacturing. And those manufacturers were demanding a management skill level and philosophy that came with an undergraduate degree. I think that's frankly where nurses need to be, it's where med techs need to be, it's where aid workers need to be, it's where our cafeteria workers need to be in terms of sort of a fundamental understanding that does not exist in our education programs today that I think five years and ten years from now needs to be a part of education and health care if we are going to address what I think is an industry cultural issue where we are not as safe as other industries are. I did all uh, what, the, what uh, both gentlemen talked about. Um, just want to give a diff little different perspective of our health center. We started 25 years ago with 30 employees and 1,500 patients. We now have 26,000 patients coming to our health center, 26% of the city. We have 270 employees. Our average employee 
is been at the health center. Our health center has been 25 years. We've had is 15 years. Our average physician is 12 years. We've made it a point to try as we moved along to try to provide education, training, payment for training, and the advent of BCC coming close to our campus has been a, a godsend because we've been working very closely with them. In that we've been sending our employees over to develop the skills. We have 15. Uh, people going full time, we encourage it at BCC. We also encourage ad hocracy. What we're finding is, is that we have a three-pronged challenge. Our obligation is not only to fill the positions that, that we talked about and provide education for them, but it's also to maintain the people that we have. We have a 270 employees. Healthcare has changed. You have Affordable Care Act. You have different needs. You have informatics. Now. We have a responsibility to our employees, either through IT training, either through education for uh, medical assistance, the whole group. So my challenge is to work with the university, uh, with BCC, in providing ad hoc work for them, also providing uh, educational training and funding for it. That is the challenge of, of us, number one. Number two is we need to work with the college and with education to let them know what we're looking for as far as training. Thirdly, when we talk about literacy rate, we're just going through like an unbelievable thing. You know, you, you, the news this morning was about people signing up for the Affordable Care Act and they can't get into the system. Well, you know, when we talk about the, uh, the governor talks about 98% of the people in uh, Massachusetts are covered and we're very proud of that. Well, I guess we must get all the 2% at our health center. Because <clears throat> we have 23% of our, uh, our patients coming in with no coverage, no knowledge of what the coverage is, totally without any coverage at all. Now, this is gonna be exacerbated by the fact by December 15th, people have to sign on or be signed on into the new healthcare system. And the way it's working on now, the good news is the people have the ability to coverage but the bad news is it's taken one hour per patient to get on. We have eight people that work in benefits to try to get people onto the coverage. But if you're getting eight per day, and there's like 30, 40,000 people that you have to sign up, it's going to be almost impossible. So when we're open January 1st, we'll have patients coming in with no coverage. So I think when you see this, when you see the, uh, this kind of a problem, it's a problem of education too. I think. I would challenge not only that we develop more what we call navigator training and helping people, uh, the, there'll be employment for going out, community health workers, getting people on the system. People don't have the website. You know, when the, when the president talks about getting on the website, they're assuming that people have computers, all right? And this is not true. And I think that what I look at is not only a third, uh, fourth arm to our, to our challenge is to train people, develop classes within the community. We're willing to sponsor that. We have a large auditorium. Get people in and put them on a web and have instructors going by and have them, them signing on. So then you have a multiplier. Thank you, Peter. And that's a, a great segue into the next question. And um, one of the things that we're looking at is how do you see your needs changing within the three to five years, especially with the passage of 224. We know that there's um, several different occupations that are specifically mentioned in the act itself. Um, a lot of work on nurse practitioners, um, physician's assistants, patient-centered care. How does that affect the workforce for your particular organizations? And Peter, if we could start off with you in the community health center. Well, we kind of have already started. We've uh, started uh, our billing department and our medical assistants are uh, getting training at BCC. BCC is actually coming to the health center and uh, having classes training for the new ICD-10 coding that's going to be happening in, uh, I think, October of 2014. And uh, it's, a, it's a big difference, a big challenge. And that's an example of things that we have to do to enhance and develop the skill sets of what we already have within the health center. So we're, we're kind of doing that. There are, there are jobs 
for example, medical records. We had a medical records department. We employed 12 people. Well, we now have an electronic health record, and we have people that need to have their skill sets developed, elsewhere they lose their jobs. So it would be a sad commentary to be advertising for people to have jobs in the, in the health center and in the, in the same vein having people lose their jobs. So what we've done is we've tried to develop their skill sets so we're, we're helping them. That's, I think that's the, uh, the big challenge. I think the changes in our workforce will happen slowly, honestly, with Chapter 224. I don't think it would be dramatic. Uh, we've been working in an environment similar to taking risk for five years. And so we've made a lot of changes over that period of time. And if you look back at the percentage of employees we have from different professions, I don't think it's honestly changed a lot. We do need more behavioral health workers and skilled social workers. And I think we'll continue to begin pushing toward helping our staff reach out to the home. As, a, as an example, we started a program this year in our own nursing school, um, which is a diploma program, add in an additional staff and we're going, we're, we're taking clinical outreach to the home for our Medicare patients because we thought nursing students should know what home health was like and it's not typically a clinical rotation that they get during a normal nursing school. So we wanted to give them a clinical rotation in the home and we wanted to begin understanding the transitions of care between the hospital and the home and we thought we would do that through our own nursing school. I think that kind of change will be slow and incremental over time. And then we're seeing pressure on information technology and coding really to get data out of our systems of electronic medical records. And, and again, that's one person here and two people there. It's not sea change of 15, 20, or 30 people. In regards to uh, the healthcare professions, I, I, a lot of literature has been out there in terms of the shortage, uh, and the shortage eased when the recession hit, uh, and uh, it will come back. The demographics show pretty clearly that as boomers uh, age, uh, they will retire uh, once their 401ks are back, and it uh, seems to be getting there. Um, so, so we will be back into a shortage mode with the, with the clinical professions. Uh, beyond that, I, I would say and echo, I think Kim did an excellent job of an overview of the change in the healthcare system. So to those points, uh, we are seeing changes with shifting to our work being outside of hospitals versus inside of hospitals. In the physician practices, our physician practices are growing. Uh, the employed group, uh, five years ago, we had approximately 40 or so physicians employed by South Coast. We now have more than 300. Uh, that number will be more than 400 in 2014 and continue to grow very significantly. Uh, with that, with the Affordable Care Act, a uh, change that will be happening is patient-centered medical homes where the healthcare team will be working more closely together so people will be seeing more nurse practitioners for routine visits rather than physicians. Nurse practitioners will have basically their own patients being overseen by, uh, by a physician. Uh, so we continue to recruit uh, heavily with nurse practitioners. With nurse practitioners and, and along the continuum to medical assistance, we, um, uh, we are, need people to work at what we say is top of the license. So that they need to be fully engaged and working at their fullest license capability. And so that's to the skills upgrade that we talked about earlier. We're engaged in a planning grant with BCC under the uh, the Transformation Fund uh, on medical assistance. We're partnering with UMass Dartmouth and other facilities, sending nurses back for bachelor's degrees and doctorate degree, uh, master's degrees and doctorate degrees, because we see that as elevating the nursing practice w within our organization. So we have thir some 30 nurses who are being fully funded for their education, going back for their master's degrees. And, and doctorate degrees. And, and then the last area is IT, and, and Kim talked about that as well. An incredible investment needed to change our uh, information, information technology infrastructure. Uh, we have just uh, uh, signed on with, with a, a group, a national group, to change our IT structure. Uh, we will be hiring 40 uh, information technology professionals 
uh, as part of that project. There's another 40 people that we're pulling out of operations to work on this project will be backfilled a total of 80 people full-time dedicated to the implementation of this IT platform that we'll be bringing in over the next two years. So an incredible change in terms of uh, information technology as well. Thank you. Maybe they can help the president. <laughs> so all three of you had um, discussed the uh, openings and, and as we saw from Rebecca's information on the line here, um, all of these different agencies did have openings, a variety of openings that they're advertising for um, help wanted. As you look at your new candidates, how do you assess a new candidate, specifically someone who is graduating right out of college, and what do you value most in those candidates? Uh, we value core values very much so. Um, we're dealing with a very uh, sensitive community, people that have many problems, multifaceted problems, things that we can't even think about. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm proud to say that our employees mirror the community. So when you come to uh, our health center, you'll see uh, various uh, ethnicities. Uh, we work with the community, and uh, I think that um, values, core values are, are very important to us. I think that uh, you see it in our turnover rate. Our turnover rate is, is non-existent almost. Uh, and, and the reason is is that we look at the, uh, I'm an example of it. I came there for one year and I've been here 25 years. It's, it, it's that kind of a thing. And um, it's a community health center. It's uh, when they talk about medical home, developing a medical home, we are a medical home. So that's what we look for. So. That's great. Um, I think we're valuing compassion as we always have and teamwork as we always have. As, as I mentioned, we're going through what I think is a sea change relative to lean and its expectations and its impact on the organization. We now, as we hire managers, and it's sort of going to go from, I think, the highest level in the organization down to the worker across our organization, but now lean experience has become the differentiator for all of the managers we hire regardless of where they go into the institution because as we we're into a six year what we've mapped out it is six to eight years worth of change and as we've changed as an organization we can no longer bring in a manager from the outside and just plop them in the organization because the way we manage is so fundamentally different they are left behind and it's taking us a year to get a manager up to speed to work in our system based on just a very different way of expectation and management. So that's become to be a challenge to have any turnover and come in from the outside without understanding lean. I think as lean goes down in the organization, the same is going to happen. And I think over time, human resources will change how we interview. They're going to change what skill set they look at. They're going to change what background they demand. And if they don't, it's going to take five to six months to bring in someone from the outside even in non-skilled jobs to place them in the organization because the organization is changing and we're going through that change it's going to take us four or five years to get there as it works its way down through the organization i think what we're looking for has been touched on by a, no, a number of comments here today uh, just to highlight them uh, beyond uh, as kim said beyond the compassion and caring which we've always looked for uh, I think again that level of service. So in, in all in all positions. So uh, in the housekeeper position, it's it's no longer just does somebody have a good work record? Does somebody have a good attendance record? It's more about are they connecting with people? Are they engaging people? How are they in their their interview in terms of doing that? We use uh, behaviorally based interviewing to put people into different situations related to customer service. How would you react in, in a situation where somebody asks for assistance? How do you react when somebody's standing in the corridor and, and not moving? Uh, you know, how, how do people respond to those situations from the housekeeper through, through the, uh, through the health, healthcare professions? How do people communicate? Uh, as Peter said, we try to have our workforce reflect the community. Uh, we have people who are multilingual. 
Uh, that, that's a positive for us, uh, that we want our patients to feel comfortable in our environment, and if they hear their own language being spoken in the environment, that's clearly a, a positive for us. So whether it be in, in any language, again, it's that ability to communicate with somebody. And then I touched on it earlier, but, but moving from that task orientation to a broader problem-solving orientation. What do you do when you don't have a clear direction on something? How would you think through this sort of process? Something that used to be reserved for management interviewing now is being asked through all interviewing. We have developed, uh, we haven't developed, we've signed on with an assessment uh, process for new employees that speaks to uh, their tendencies in terms of communication, et cetera. We're using that with applicants as they are coming in. Quick assessment test, but it gives us some baseline, something that we hadn't done in, in prior years. So the, the bar is being raised, I think, all along in terms of not just can people do their job, but how will people do their job. And Kim and Peter, if you could just respond to whether or not you use specific tools, such as David, um, in your recruitment process. It's a short answer, we're not, but we need to be. Uh, we're not, no. Thank you. So as we move along, all of you have mentioned some type of collaborations that you've had with different colleges and universities. And I guess what we're hoping to do part of today is to see how we can take that to the next level. So the next question really is centered on how we can help how the colleges can continue to work with these industries and how we can really help to foster that relationship. With BCC specifically, um, you know, the last two, three years, it's been absolutely a marvelous experience. They uh, come to our health center. Um, we go to them. We have meetings where we're just going through a, where David was talking about customer relations, where We've de developed a customer relations program for our, uh, our employees, all our employees that deal with patients. P patients don't know whether you're a doctor or, or a, uh, a nurse or what have you. I think it's important that you uh, uh, have customer relation values and have values of the health center. So uh, that's been ver working very well. We are also uh, have an affiliation with UMass Medical School in Worcester. We're in our th uh, third year residency and Next year, we'll be having uh, students for uh, full campus, hopefully uh, for full semester. Hopefully, what we do, is, and in my opening remarks, we're trying to get people that have sensitivities as related to community health. And what we're looking for is to get physicians, not that are looking to get their loan repayment taken care of because they're in a, an area that's uh, short of doctors who are not seeing the underserved. We want people who uh, see that as a challenge and want to get involved with our patients. So uh, I'm starting to see inklings of that. We just had an application from somebody that uh, was going through our program three years ago and sent an application in for an open position. So I think that's very good. So um, I just am very pleased with our relationship with BCC. And I, I see that as very encouraging. And I've told the board, even in our strategic planning, that uh, this is the, uh, the challenge and the opportunity, and the opportunity is BCC, and we're re very pleased with it. Thank you. I think our challenge um, at Brockton is to narrow the experience gap, just as you found in your data that we're looking for people that have more than two years' experience. I think as, as people do retire and take their retirement, I, I hope I reach that age at some point, and, and I still have a 401k left that has some money in it. Um, I think as that happens, we're clearly going to be pulling from people coming out of school more than we have in the past, but, but that's going to leave us this educational and experiential gap. And somehow improving the internships we have or the experience base of getting people in our institutions to understand the jobs, to narrow that gap of education, of onboarding, I think will be important for us over time, however we find a way to do that. Uh, I'll echo what Peter said about the partnerships that exist within the region, and I think for years uh, with BCC and with UMass, uh, we've had a relationship where we have discussed about what our needs are based upon turnover and growing professions. 
Uh, and those have been fruitful discussions. And, and then most recently with uh, Chancellor Grossman, we've had further discussions on somewhat of a uh, broad level. We, we also, uh, Len Coriati and Tom Pereira have, uh, you know, fostered a uh, healthcare collaborative recently uh, in the past year where we're trying to pull together various employers and educational institutions and talk about what the needs are, what the gaps are, and how the education institutions can, can assist with, with the needs within different organizations. So in those traditional senses, I think we've done a lot of good work. Um, we've partnered with BCC on a central sterile uh, uh, tech program on, under Pat Dent's leadership uh, and host that at, at our Charlton site and uh, tried, to, tried to use that in terms of filling positions as well. I think moving forward, as we've expressed, our needs continue to grow. And so our needs to partner continue to grow. And I think the intensity of that relationship will, will need to grow. Uh, while we've talked about what are the needs in, in terms of nursing or pharmacists or respiratory or radiology, uh, I think we need to move beyond that in terms of what are the, the deeper needs in terms of customer service. What, what, what is our reality in our workplace and how can curriculums merge, you know, of course we expect them to merge to us, uh, merge to what our needs are and use our, uh, you know, our current situations and our future situations to drive the curriculums and therefore drive the training. So I, I see the need for training to continue to grow pretty significantly in the future and, and that level of relationship to be much tighter, uh, as good as it's been to be even much tighter in the future. One thing that <clears throat> that we've noticed at the uh, at the health center and noticed in New Bedford that is uh, really concerning, uh, you have a lot of people like we have that uh, have a low literacy rate. Uh, that uh, I think that the challenge to us too is to maybe go out to the high schools and grade schools and talk about uh, what may be available to some of the kids coming out of high school. I think that's an important thing. Uh, just concerns me. Uh, the things we're seeing. The, the other problem that, that I think we haven't mentioned, which is a big challenge to, the, to all of New Bedford, I don't know about Fall River and other areas, but uh, lit, uh, we have a lot of people that, have, that are, we're challenged with that uh, are Spanish-speaking, Latins, uh, uh, and other nationalities, and that makes it very difficult. It makes it very difficult for the doctor to perform his duties because we have a full translation department. We have seven people in it that are constantly going back and forth and have to translate. I mean, that, uh, that's like 9,000 out of our 26,000 patients are fully dependent on another language. So that's a challenge. And I think that that's a challenge for the whole community to work with. Thank you. And I do have a few more questions, but before I get on with that, I wanted to open it up to the floor. David? David Augustino from the Cape Islands, working for the best support, I don't think that. The, um, I'm married, I have no pictures, please. The, um, I'm engaged, of course, in trying to train individuals into your uh, businesses, and what we've been finding for the last couple of years, and what you've confirmed today, is that you're looking for more experienced individuals um, there's a little gap between what I can provide them before they, I'm trying to get them hired and what you're looking for. How can we work on trying to close that gap between newly trained individuals and what your needs are now is for someone that you say with experience in the medical fields, um, I, I'm finding that I'm training people, I'm spending money, but you're not hiring them. And perhaps if you could also address any on-the-job training programs you might have. I think one of the things we could do is uh, develop a program where we have internships, where people can actually uh, work at, the, at our health center, for example, uh, and that would give them the experience base to come back, and maybe for themselves, too, to know if they're going in the right direction. I think that that's a, a way out of, uh, to work with that. It's a wonderful question, and I'm glad you're asking it because it's got to feel frustrating to uh, spin your wheels and not feel like you're really helping people get into the industry they want to be in. 
Uh, I don't know the answer. I think the answer lies to me in person by person, job by job. I don't know how to get there any other way. I'd be happy to sit down with the local workforce people. I know for Brockton, if they're experiencing the same issues, and really, I think, look candidate by candidate, job by job, and say, what was the gap? How might we have filled that gap? How could we have made someone a better applicant? And I think maybe diving down to the individual level and then trying to see if there's commonality as it comes back up might help us answer that gap. But it's too broad for me to, I think, feel comfortable with an answer other than saying maybe we have to sit down and really work at it person by person and see if we can find common trends. Well, it is a tough question, so I'm not glad you asked it, but uh, I'll do my best to answer. Um, I, I think that, that uh, the people that we see uh, coming from the Workforce Investment Board programs are usually for the uh, non-licensed positions, uh, CNAs uh, uh, and, and other professions. So usually, in our experience, the where we're looking for experience is usually tied to the licensed people. You know, for example, in nursing, we will hire a number of new grads. Uh, but then when we're looking for a surgical nurse, you know, which takes a year to train somebody, obviously we'd prefer to hire somebody with experience than, than, than have that year of training. Um, I, I think uh, for folks coming in, it, it's a lot about those soft skills that we talked about. Uh, when, when somebody's coming in, you know, for those non-licensed positions, can they make the connection with people? Do they communicate well with people? Are they, how are they presenting? And I think in the past, again, the focus has been what's their work record and, and good attendance and things like that while still in place, but the bar has been raised. And, and I think, quite frankly, in hospitals for years, people thought, well, it's a softer place to work, you know, and, and you know, be more open to, to bringing people in. The bar has been raised, and from, from that housekeeper, the, the food and nutrition folks, the CNAs, and onward through transport, et cetera. It has to be somebody who relates well to people, can communicate with people, and as Kim pointed out, can look at a problem and I, at least identify the problem, hopefully have some sort of resolution or at least raise it rather than continuing on with their daily work. Thank you, uh, Jack Sprague at Bristol Community College. Uh, I'd like to follow up on David's question, and uh, and uh, as an observer uh, with an associate nursing program, very robust and vibrant and high quality, I've watched with interest the hospitals. Uh, David, when you mentioned raising the bar, uh, I think it's a, uh, I, I'm an outsider, but I think it's a mis mistaken way to raise the bar to require a baccalaureate. Uh, in just in our region, um, uh, we have Cape Cod Community College and Massasoit Community College, as well as Bristol, all with associate, very excellent uh, nursing programs. And uh, UMass, I uh, was talking to uh, Jim and Davina earlier about it, they, uh, it seems that they're going to have to absorb all of our associate graduates uh, in addition to their rising junior class uh, for uh, the capacity, and, and I'm afraid it's not going to happen. So on the, building on this previous question about uh, internal, if you will, if that's the way to use it, internal training or uh, grooming, and uh, uh, I, I wonder if that, about the wisdom of requiring a baccalaureate. And I, I hope that you, maybe you could comment on that before I blame you for the downfall of Western civilization. <laughs> I wish I, w I wish I wasn't sitting at this end of the table. Well, you know, it, it goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, that, that uh, we've had a great partnership with BCC, and, and we recruit grads from BCC and with wonderful success. Um, I think as we do talk about raising the bar, uh, each profession is responding in that way. and. The nursing profession, the nursing, uh, the um, countrywide organizations, our professional organizations are raising the standards and with the expectation towards a bachelor's degree. I, I think that's fueled by some of the discussion that we said about the problem solving ability, the, the ability to think through issues, which is tied usually to the baccalaureate degree. No. Uh, derogatory intent in terms of the associate degree, but I think that's what it's being spoken to. And we continue to see 
the internal training. Uh, we do have a tuition reimbursement program, people going back to school at UMass uh, to, to get their bachelor's degree in nursing and in other professions. So uh, I, I think it's always a controversial issue. Um, my daughter just finished her physical therapy program, doctorate in physical therapy as an entry level. And her mother was, has a bachelor's degree in physical therapy, and they do the same thing in the same profession. But I, I think that's the professional associations are driving the expectations in large part in reflection to what the industry is demanding. So we hope there's a way to, uh, you know, we continue to hire BCC grads, but more and more the expectation as we hire them is that they commit to going back to school for that bachelor's degree. And, right. You're not off the hook. I'm not off the hook. Um, we also have a diploma program and an AD program and have just had a partnership with Fisher College to be able to provide a bachelor's in nursing on our campus at Brockton. That nursing school is the oldest diploma program in, in the Commonwealth. It goes back to 1895. Um, for us, we don't demand a bachelor's degree, but it is a trend that's going around the country. I think it's fueled by by both the nursing profession, magnet status, which hospitals are, are wanting to be able to say they are, and to be magnet, you have to have a large percentage of your staff uh, with a bachelor's degree, and that has become a differentiator in the Boston market for sure, as I understand a lot of the academic hospitals will no longer hire someone without a bachelor's degree. And so I think it's a fundamental shift that is happening around the country. It was happening when I was in Dallas. Many of the large institutions in Dallas had become magnet and we're pushing for bachelor's degree programs. Now, unfortunately, I would also say that just because a nurse has a bachelor's degree doesn't mean she's a good problem solver. She hasn't been trained in airproofing. She doesn't know anything about safety systems. She doesn't know why airplanes actually fell out of the sky. And, and, they're, and they can't help us uh, really improve their system as they, as they go along. So I, it, it is the industry's attempt to figure out how we change the skill level of people coming into the jobs. And so they've latched on to a bachelor's degree as an answer, but it hasn't, I think, proven to be the answer, yet it's a trend that's changed anyway. It's like that train left the track, and it's gone, and, and it's really changed. And it's to get a different level of critical thinking skills, but I'm not sure it's really answered the question for us. I think we've had about 15 people that have gone through the program recently, and um, the people that I know at the, at the health center are on their own planning to go for their bachelor's. So we encourage that, uh, and that's been working real well. In fact, uh, as a side note, when the governor was uh, in uh, New Bedford and he was uh, going around asking people, uh, where do you come from? Says Greater New Bedford Community Health Center, Greater New Bedford Community. There were 15 out of the 20 or 25 that uh, were in a panel. And he says, what is this Greater New Bedford Community Health Center? So I mean, um, I was very proud of our uh, organization and I, I'm really happy with the uh, 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 work we've been doing together. Sure, sure. Um, well, thank you for the discussion. Um, as somebody with a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in nursing, I feel that I can opine on the, the last part of the conversation. Um, I do think that the profession has changed in a revolutionary way, and it's driven by the changes in the healthcare system. So um, I couldn't help Kim but comment that, uh, is it 12%? More going toward 15% of nurses are male, so, uh, and our dean of nursing is not a she, so. Uh, so I, th I think that's a change too happening, obviously, because um, there's more and more gender diversity as a result of the professional opportunities continuing to, continuing to grow. Um, I wanted to look at the issue of curriculum, um, not just in nursing, but also in other areas of health, because some of the comments you made um, clearly point to a different kind of curriculum uh, because of the provider or professional that you're expecting to graduate at the end of the program. So, um, so what I uh, detected from all the remarks was you were talking about the shift, uh, David, to uh, care in the home, care in the ambulatory setting, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Peter, you mentioned that as well. Um, you talked about safety. I mean, Kim, you talked about the need for more focus on safety, error-prone systems, 
Um, you also talked about technology, how pervasive technology is, and I do think that that's a major disruptor. It's a major disruptor also in the academe. I mean, what we're doing, I mean, when you look at MOOCs, you know, those massive open online courses, that's going to change what we do in colleges and universities. Uh, I'm not that worried about MOOC point one yet, but I think MOOC point two, two, 2.0, 2.3 is definitely going to create revolutionary changes for us. So um, help us bridge the gap between what you're expecting at the end, the person that applies to you for a position, and then what we need to do in the academe uh, in curriculum. Because I think these are programs that are, for us, nationally accredited. Uh, they're not easy to change uh, and to retool. Um, and we, have, we tend to have very bureaucratic processes in academia. So help us with rethinking how we restructure the curriculum so that what we have at the end is a person that has some of these skill sets and, and some of the content areas also that need to be there in the curriculum. You can't start in the middle, huh? <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I think I am going to steal some of Kim's thunder in, in terms of the process improvement piece, which he has mentioned several times. And I think beyond the, the clinical um, core courses that any profession is having, uh, it's, it's beyond those courses that we would look in terms of curriculum change. So issues like process improvement, um, I think they have quantitative analysis in, in, in most of their, their uh, courses, but quantitative analysis, I think, beyond the individual patient care uh, is, it will be important. Um, the, um, I, I think that problem-solving focus, again, beyond the, the clinical uh, situation, which I think professions are well-versed in terms of how to resolve an immediate problem uh, clinically. It's beyond that in terms of how to resolve uh, uh, an issue in terms of service delivery, in terms of um, behavioral uh, action between a patient and a care caregiver, et cetera. Those are the areas that we see uh, a need for more internal training because we don't see people coming out with those sorts of skills. So process improvement and the problem solving are the two main areas that I see. I would just say ditto. I think we're going to have to find a way to embed it somewhere in the existing educational classes. And, and it's equally a challenge for us. I honestly haven't gotten it added to our own nursing program, though I know we need to. And I think it's embedding it in their coursework somewhere. Um, and I think that it's got to be seen as in the same way we want to see them as the way they work. We need to find a way for clinical education for sure to see it as part of the educational package for the way they think and the way they measure their own success and the way they engage in improvement. And I don't know how, I mean, that, all, that all sounds like concepts to me, so I don't know how to make it real. So m maybe the best way I can make it real for just an, one example is in one of our internal medicine practices, where we are a long way along in a pilot with lean, we have cascaded our goals down to that physician practice. So they have people goals, quality, safety, finance, and growth goals. And we're expecting staff, not management, to be the responsible person for all of those goals. Stand up in a meeting once a month and say, we had a, we had a drop call rate of 10% last month, and we've gone in to look at, was it a drop call rate from 11 to 12, 12 to 1, and we've dug into those numbers, and here's all the information, and we have, a, as, as I know we both have, a no-show rate of our patients, and we've studied the no-show rate for the last month, and we know whether it's because it's a new patient, it's, it's a it's a patient who's coming in for a scheduled appointment. It was a sick patient. They called two days in advance. They called the day in advance. We called them before. We called them after. And, and it's being driven by the receptionist with a high school education or the MA in the back who's been tasked with, you own that goal of decreasing our no-show rate because we can't take care of patients that don't show up. And it's not the management's job anymore. It's your job in between your work to go dig into the data and find out why people didn't show and give us creative solutions to make that happen. Now, that's an educational process. It's a thinking process. 
and then as they discover, it will be a tool and technique process that comes out of lean process management for how they solve those problems, which is about error proofing and innovation. And we're asking staff to stand up in front of their peers and really take us through what they've learned in the previous month and what they're going to do differently next month. And that's staff level, not management. So it's a fundamental part of the way they now see their daily job is to do this other work while I'm doing this work is capture that information and analyze it for us. I don't know how to explain it in any other way, but it's that fundamental for us. I agree. Uh, I think your, your question, too, was whether uh, beyond, as we all have in our industry's rigidity of curriculum, that there are uh, th items and issues that we would want addressed uh, that probably don't exist. And I think the whole thing is communication. And I think that uh, uh, we need to communicate better, and we, and we do, I think. And, um, and and plan. Like, like, what is your plan for the... Would, would, do we see as needs for the uh, for the future, and what kind of levels of training would you see us needing? Uh, one of the things that's coming out is the community health worker. I mean, these people are going to be going out to homes. Uh, they're going to be uh, most of them are just high school graduates. How are they going to converse? How are they going to handle themselves? You know, what training do they? They're going to need a lot of training, and uh, we have to address that. We can't just send people out there and just I mean, just can't do that. So. Thank you, everyone. And um, just looking at the time, I know there's a lot of questions. I see a lot of hands, but I'm kind of getting the signal that we're just about done for the day. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for coming. And uh, as in all good conversations, they lead you to wanting more. Um, and we certainly do want to get more information, but I think we've gotten some really great nuggets as we prepare. I think one of the positives that have come out is we're looking at IT as a, you know, an entirely subculture, subsection of the healthcare industry. So there's quite a few different nuggets that we've been able to take from today's um, session, and I do want to thank Kathleen Kirby for sponsoring it. And you can email Kathleen. For any of your continued questions, you can email Kathleen, and she will see that those questions get to our panelists and get a response back to you. And on behalf of Connect, I would like to thank Peter, Kim, and David for being our panelists and subjecting yourselves to our questions and um, giving us some great insight on your profession. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca.